Until I came out with that pamphlet that was commissioned by the United States Information Service um, and so on, nobody knew a thing. Nobody ever knew a thing about it. You hear about slavery, you hear about Shengbe Piye, you hear about Amistad, Amistad, Kata Kata. A lot of people came up to me and said, this Amistad thing, um, I can't really believe that. <laughs> um, and I said, well, why not? Mm -hmm. And they would say, well, it's too big. To Shengbe Piye, he didn't come in the 45 Sahel Unions, treaty tier one bobo. They attack the Amistad, the hip kata kata, kitty kata, the hip kata kata. The story of the Amistad is a story inside a story. It is a story <laughs> that needs to be told for us to understand that. Amistadu, Amistadu, A M I S T A D. Amistad. So, uh, Marcos, what's the worst our visit? We want to begin now. Mm -hmm. uh, like I can explain to them. Why, 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 why are we here? We are here to learn about the history of this region. This is part of a project on a history of the Amistad Rebellion. All of the people involved in this rebellion were from the Galenus region. Long time ago, in the era of your great-great-grandfathers in slavery times, a group of people were taken from here to Lomboco on the Galenus coast and put on slave ships. Some of these people were captured in war, some were kidnapped, and they were sold to King Shaka, who then sold them to a Spanish slave trader. These people were taken to Cuba, sold, then loaded onto another ship called Amistad. These men, mostly men, four children, made a revolt on board the ship and captured it. The ship sailed to the north, to the United States, where they were captured and put in jail. They went to court, and the question was, should they be sent as slaves back to Cuba, or should they gain their freedom? It was a big surprise. The American court ruled that they should be free. Eight months later, they returned to Freetown, and many of them returned to their families. This was a very big event in the struggle against slavery. We want to know if uh, you or the elders know about Sengbe Piye. You know, I'm a traditional historian who works with documents. Almost all the documents about the Amistad case are here in the United States. So to do the book that I did in a fairly traditional way, it didn't require a trip to Sierra Leone. Having studied the event, I then knew that I had to really figure out who these people were. Where had they come from in Sierra Leone? What were their experiences in Sierra Leone? What kinds of things had happened to them back there that equipped them to capture this slave ship? Between 1750 and 1850, slavers forced a quarter of a million people aboard slave ships in the ports of Sierra Leone, ghostly vessels full of lost souls bound for the plantations of the Americas. A person very knowledgeable about that country, Conrad Tuxer of St. John's University, said, let's take the book to Sierra Leone and talk to people there about it. We recruited his colleague, Philip Misevich, another Sierra Leone specialist, to join us. Both Conrad and Phil had helped me a great deal in writing the book, published in 2012. 
Now they help to organize our trip to Sierra Leone. They have guest house in Puerto Rico. Yeah, we can sleep in Puerto Rico yeah. once. You can't just show up there and start that kind of work. We needed connections. We needed a connection to someone like Tazif Karoma, lecturer in linguistics at Fura Bay College. Tazif himself was from this region, southern Sierra Leone. He knows all the chiefs. He stays in touch with them. We came into a situation in which we were trusted. Tazif is an amazing on-the-ground guy. He knows how to address problems that come up in the midst of field work, which are frequent. He has essentially played some and often a great role in every scholar who's done some sort of work on Sierra Leone for the past probably three decades. We were also very fortunate to have two skilled and knowledgeable drivers, Cherno and Jibriel, and a very well-known filmmaker from Freetown named Idris Kapanga. We went to Sierra Leone to recover a lost history from below. We wanted to deepen our understanding of the uprising of 1839, especially the Amistad rebels themselves. We wanted to make them real as people, as makers of history. We wanted a visual sense of the countryside, a feeling for place, their place, their world, before the ordeal of enslavement. We wanted to restore the essential African side of the story, that was our objective. So this is the, the area we're going. So what we're going to do is, we're going to this area, this area. We wanted to find Lomboko, a slave trading factory where the ghastly voyage into slavery began and we wanted to find the home villages of the Amistad Africans. Every time we went to a new region, we had to get authorization to speak to people from a paramount chief and a section chief. They were responsible for our well-being as visitors, and they needed to know our purposes. As we showed respect for the chiefs and sought their goodwill, we were, in fact, showing respect to all of the people of the region. Even though we had credibility given to us by Tazif, and even though we had the permission of various chiefs to be there, we were still uncertain how we would be received when this group of outsiders rolled into a village with many questions. Discussions with the elders were challenging. We had to understand the complexities of Mende culture and approach them accordingly. So we're interested in the history of this village. We had all been talking about how important it is to ask what we often call these kind of open-ended questions. You know, instead of saying, we want to talk right about the Amistad, uh, Tazif was great in particular in this case, you start with questions like, well, tell me about the history of your town. Tell me about the leaders who founded the town. And if you can get them to give up information uh, that coincides with, that supports the evidence from the Amistad case, that's a surefire way of building up a stronger case of evidence. But if you feed them information, you're never really sure whether you're, they're telling you what they think you want to hear or something else entirely. We were in search of Sengbei's home village, and Conrad had the exceptional idea that he should talk to people who really knew this country by driving around in it. We uh, consulted lorry drivers yeah. and took a map, uh, went to a, a local station in Kenema, 
and uh, had the help of some 20 lorry drivers who all you know put the the the, the points for us uh, and showed us where we would look. And I think this was actually the key to figuring out which region Sengbei came from. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have more work to do on this, but uh, I do feel that we eliminated some of the other mm -hmm. sites by the same name uh, and that we were really in the right place. Want to see whether you have a sense of history of anybody called Singbe? Singbe, 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 he said he was liked by the by the warrior, the leader. He said Shigbe was released. He went and he was released. Does she know what happened to this man eventually? She is saying that she is saying that well, she's too old now, she cannot remember. Yield anything good there? It, we, we couldn't really get what we were looking for in the sense that uh, none of the evidence that we had was really firmly confirmed by people here, uh, neither the king or the chief or the stories. The one most promising thing was what the older woman said about the she had heard from her grandfather about a man who had sold the slavery and come back. But it was just, as she said, she's very old. She mm -hmm. didn't remember there really wasn't a lot of it. The region where we were traveling was a hot spot for the Civil War in Sierra Leone between 1991 and 2002. And in fact, we saw the effects of this daily. We saw it in village poverty, in recently filled cemeteries, even in the roads which were rutted and bombed out to prevent the transport of government troops. Long-standing poverty caused by the slave trade and British imperialism had been made worse by war. It was uh, hot, we were on the road very long hours, and at times we had great frustration because we couldn't find what we were looking for. Yeah, follow me. The canoe's not good for the no, no, equipment, no. the we're filming Daru. equipment. Not right? okay. After okay. Daru, we're not uh, Yeah, so we'll go to Daru. Okay. That okay. sounds good. Okay. We're going to pay a quick visit to the Paramount Chief. So just you going? No, we all, he wants all of us to go. There's no way to deny that request. Um, He's, the Paramount Chief's here in Chebuema, too. There's no way our map reading was going to be anything other than a communal event. I, <laughs> yep. So uh, we, we learned something. Sengbei's village had been completely destroyed by the wars of slavery times. So we were eager to ask people about a place an American scribe wrote down as Mani. Thank you for greeting us in your village. Yeah, I said, Wakauma. Did, did anyone ever hear of a village around here that might have been destroyed in war called Mani? Yeah. 
They had, a, they had a very good historian here. He's talking about. He kept the things in his head, but he just died in February. 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 Died in February. This brings to mind the famous words spoken by the African sage Amadou Hampate Ba. In Africa, when an elder dies, a library burns down. But if they had known anything here that made us think that this was the region, but there was nothing. There was nothing. It's clear this is a relatively new town. Yeah, exactly. they, when they were reciting the genealogy of leadership, it, seems, it went uh, about three generations. Yeah. Phil has brought uh, a wealth of knowledge to this project uh, because he understands how African names are often mm -hmm. uh, transcribed, mm -hmm. um, and not just transcribed by outsiders, but transcribed by outsiders according to where uh, they come from and yes. what kinds of traditions of transcription they have in their home countries. Mm -hmm. And I think that for others, they might miss those things if they don't have a deep knowledge of the Mende. Right. Mm -hmm. So what Tazif would frequently do is sound out the name several different ways. It could be this, it could be that. Kalumbu or Kalumbu or Kuyobo, Bunge or Gonge, Amani or Maina. Maina. Maina is here. We conducted numerous interviews in the Galinas region. This was the home, the seat of power, of the great Vai King Shaka, the leading slave trader in the entire region. So we can begin now in a systematic order. So Madam Hungary Namwe, okay, it's a bear bear. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your crown will he says the first crown, that crown they talk about, mm. was given to King Shaka. By he will not tell your figure. White man. White man gave him. Mm -hmm. Tazif, could you say something about why those people were so suspicious of us? Because they did talk to us, but there was a tension there that we didn't find really anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, they thought that we are comfortable to collect the crown. Mm. So the crown is important to them as a symbol of the opportunity of the Masakwe village. Mm -hmm. so it's still a powerful family. Yeah. You see a powerful family, but not out of power now. So mm -hmm. if you're out of power, who can come? There are suspicions that we can go to get their crown. We are, we are there to get their crown back and give it to the central government. Mm -hmm. That will be the end of the history. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing that is left now. How, how, does, how do the people of this village feel about King Shaka? King Shaka is not going to be here. King Shaka is not going to be here. He's 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 going to be here. He was a good man for the white people. He's going to be here. 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 He's going to be he said, King Shaka used to fill the ship with young men, young boys, women, and men, take them to somewhere in Europe or America. Then when they came back, they brought boots of Pade, Pade, with gunpowder and gun. What we found in the village of Blama is a cannon that was sent here by King Shaka in order to fortify this village. He would have gotten this cannon from Pedro Blanco. So this cannon probably goes back to the 1830s, right around the time that the Amistad Africans were captured and shipped out of Lomboco, which was owned by Pedro Blanco, the man who provided this cannon. So this demonstrates 
the dynamics of the trade. Ask the speaker if there are any other things in the village from King Shaka's time. They had posts, then they had these long knives. Uh-huh. Very long mm. knives, the war, war knives were here. They are taken away. Interesting. There are several of them. Interesting. Why what give you a go? This is the only surviving one. There are others, but they did survive. Yeah. The proverb, you mm. should tell tell yeah. uh yeah. tell tell, mm? tell, tell this man right here with the proverb. Quoti. Okay. Be you a fellow, be you your yeah, be I am a man. When you, whether you sleep one or two nights, when you are going back, double more you make a quarty room. They give us a small token to keep the fire burning. Uh -huh. we have been taking that's uh, quality means fire stick. The fire stick, they cooked for it for you using wood. Somebody has to replace that wood so that the fire can keep keep on burning. It is an ancient tradition in many parts of Africa for those people who come in search of something to provide a gift to those they visit. It is a courtesy. It shows respect for knowledge and appreciation for their willingness to share it with us. It also sent a message to all of the younger people of the village. Look at these people who have come such a great distance to speak to our elders. Gendema, which was the seat of Shaka's sort of empire, uh, was incredibly wealthy based off of the slave trade. And you know, one of the interesting points about visiting it now, it was, I mean, it was so inaccessible. Uh, roads that were virtually closed, gr driving through high grassland area where you couldn't even see the road ahead of you. And upon arrival, just the, I mean, the absolute feeling of, of, of poverty in that area. Now, part of that, of course, is from the, the more recent civil war, but I think there's a deeper story to be told about the transition away from the slave trade in the 19th century which ultimately led toward the decline uh, of Gendema. We are in a place that is very important to the Amistad story at this moment. This is really the center uh, of power for the slave trade as it existed in 1839. King Shaka's armies would go out into different regions. They would capture entire villages. They would all then end up at Lomboko. And as he expanded his empire into the interior, in the 1830s, this is the point at which those people who would eventually be on the Amistad were caught in its catchment area. Gendema, the famous Gendema, was desolate, and uh, to see King Shaka's grave overgrown. Yeah. I don't know the number of people who are buried here, but the person I know that was buried here first was King Shaka. When uh, King Shaka was chief, there was another man called Amalalu. Mm -hmm. So he left Gindima, where he had gone up Amalau, and came and founded a town here called uh, Bangoma. Just Bangoma was just about three miles from this town. We'll visit there. Mm -hmm. As King Shaka expanded his influence, he came into conflict with other chiefs. One of them was his own stepson, Amalau. Sengbe and at least one other man among the Amistad Africans fought with Amalau against Shaka. Mm. He, I used to hear that he was, Amalau was a very big warrior here. He never saw him. But those ones who I worked with well, uh, older than myself, they used to explain this to me, narrate these stories to me. So, okay. Okay. He went, he had a small village called where they have those stream down me. Okay. After this river, there's a small stream here which we cross. That was where he beat his village. So, we can go to the site. This will help us. Those slaves he got built this embankment. Mm-hmm. Forced labor, yes. So this is the dog all around and put this thing. So what they did was, it was not just that one trench. Mm -hmm. What they did was, they dug a series of uh, mm -hmm. holes so that can lie down there, waters mm -hmm. can lie down. So this is one of the holes. Yeah, do it again. That's what they did was, they dug a series of holes so that can lie down He may have had about 50 such holes where the fighters or the warriors would lie down. 
in case the other one was breached. You have to walk. You have good shoes. <laughs> you also have good shoes. It's, I don't have good shoes. In doing history from below, what I always wanted to know is how do working class people experience history? How do they shape it? How do they contribute to the active making of history? And the Amistad case is a perfect example of that. Capturing a slave ship was very hard to do. Hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of people had tried to do that, and the overwhelming majority of them failed. So why were they successful? How did they do it? So the very first thing they would have done is to elect a leader. Professor Ernest Ndomahina is a senior member of the Wundi, the Mende Secret Warrior Society, and a repository of extraordinary knowledge about the culture of Mende warriors. Or they could have asked questions around. So who among us has any war experience? Mm -hmm. What would be the qualities or the characteristics of a great Mende warrior? He was one, the first quality of a warrior they had was he was willing to lead, to risk being killed first in case of an attack. So he was, he, he had ability to, to risk leading and he could not reverse decisions. Whatever decision you take, you don't reverse it. You don't reverse it at all. Okay. You must, you must have a so cultural Tatalisman in your neck or somewhere in your body. You should always have it. So every leader has it, you see. Like even this last war that we mm -hmm. were in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. we are having some Muslims that they, they can go and then Maybe do, some, and uh, do some cultural uh, performances on your body, mm -hmm. on, the, on a shirt, then give you some certain things. If you have it, they can even point gun at you. Nothing will happen to you. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Because so, we usually do it. So uh, in first in, in the in the olden days, they were having almost the same thing. The most experienced person in war would be chosen as the leader. As the leader, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the same thing. He was the leader of the rebellion from the first moment. What, what does Chief Lamin see in this image? What does he think about this man? They feel so happy and proud uh -huh. whenever they see such a man. Uh -huh. Although he's not alive now, uh -huh. but we feel proud of him. All of the historical evidence says that Singbe was a great speaker, yeah, I a great I orator. And, and sometimes he would speak before a great crowd of Americans. Yeah. And he would speak in Mende. Yeah, and even though the Americans couldn't understand him, they still said he was a great speaker. <laughs> in the hold of the Amistad, you had Mende people, mostly Mende. You had Bandi. You had Temne. Mm -hmm. You had Gola. You had Kono, Sherbro. How do they cooperate when they don't speak the same language? No, that is an assumption you're making. The Bandi, the Gula, they will speak Mende, the Sherbros will speak Mende, all right? And some Konos will speak Mende. But there is one other common strand you've not seen. What is that? They are all members of the Poro. Being a member of the Poro Society is a secret society, but it goes across tribes. And all the Kra tribes you've called all have it. They also had certain things in common. The secrecy, the oath, and the loyalty to that secret society could have brought them together. The Poro Society was central to the rebellion. Central to the rebellion. Central to their ability to organize themselves. It goes across the tribes. The point because there were nine or 10 different ethnicities in the whole of that ship. Do you think in, let's say, Mende country, in the villages, there is any surviving memory of the Amistad story, independent of? No, not real, not the Amistad story as, as such, but it is known that there are warriors that were captured and came back. Okay. Uh, 
When our discussion in Falu began, we knew we were in a very good place. And in fact, we could have predicted that this was our most likely site of success because we had two people who came from this village and at least one, probably two, returned uh, after the Amistad Africans came back to Sierra Leone in 1842. So that meant there was a greater likelihood that there would be surviving stories. Because he asked the question about the history of this village. The one who founded this town, the village? Bobo. 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 Chief Bobo. And we had in the record that both of the Amistad Africans had said that their king was named Bobo. So at that moment, I knew we were in the right place. Now, we had not yet told so the people anything. there that right. this is why we were interested, nor that we had this particular warrior king in mind. Two of the men who made the revolt were from this village. First man named Gilawaru. The second man's name is Fabana. Faba. A couple more facts. Mm. First, when these two men were asked who they were, mm. Mm. they said, both said, we are Fulu, we are from Fulu, mm. and our king is Bobo. This is, this is what they said in America. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When we did get to that point, there was this electrical current through the entire group, and I will never forget the look on that elder's face. His face lit up with the recognition that this was one of their people mm -hmm. because they had a common king. And this is the African way of reckoning history, of remembering the history. Also very important to know mm. that these men came back to Freetown. <laughs> and then we think they came back to this village after they returned to Sierra Leone. So we would like to know if, if anything is remembered about them from either before they left here or after they returned. Nothing is remembered. Nothing. 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 Most of the elders, who knows? This one is just a little passed away. Pass away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. They didn't come back. They are the people. They didn't come back. Oh, they didn't come as far as here. They must have, they must have come to the east, but they didn't come as far as here. They, 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 they didn't come back here to this town to okay. follow. Can I, can I give them some more information? Glaro was a very important man among the Amistad Africans. Yeah. Second most important after Shingbe. He had worked as a trader and traveled very widely around this area. Okay. Spoke Gola, Kisi, Vai, many languages. Mm. So because of... Because, <laughs> na, 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 they had to go 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 all the all the languages of the region. You have joined us. They said when he came, he changed his name. Uh, he remembers that he came back. Yes. Yeah, he came back. Yes. The white uh, man who came along with him, yes, the white they man said, came. you have now joined us. So they gave me the name Johnny. That, yes. was, that was what he said. His people, his family, call him Johnny. Johnny. He has joined the family. Johnny. He was a trader. Uh -huh. He traveled widely uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. throughout the country. He was all? He used to speak, you see? Gula, Vai, even English, broken English. I had asked Azif, how did it happen that someone got a new name? 
Mm. And he said the community will give someone a new name, because especially of after a new set of experiences yes. by which he seems to have been changed. Mm. So having lived among English-speaking people, mm. an English name was chosen. And it was Johnny. Jim. Would the uh, elder lady like to say anything? Has she heard of Johnny? Johnny, my name is Johnny. That's his, that's his grandfather, her grandfather, Johnny. Johnny is her grandfather? Yes, the granddaughter. She's descended from Johnny. Yeah. I, I can show people a picture of him. Who are you? Who are you? He came back. He came back and became a chief. Okay. I'm going to show the, let me show the, Which one? This in the middle, right here. This is the man right here. This is the man. This man right here from, from this village. In Mende culture, ancestors loom very large. The spirits of ancestors are considered to be live and present, literally on the landscape, part of everyday life. And I realized that in talking about the history of this man who had been part of the village, in recounting his history from sources that they could not have known, we were in a way bringing an ancestor home, or at least we were bringing that ancestor's history. And this was something they seemed to value uh, in a very important way. You are all part of our history. <laughs> He fears, he fears you are not taking the history for the purpose of retaliation. <laughs> I don't understand. You don't understand. You are getting all this history, you get all the facts, and you go and prosecute them. And in that moment, I felt that the ghost of race and slavery and colonialism was literally hovering just above our heads. No, no, no. No, you never, not a history, you saw me again. The teacher. That he would worry about this event that took place more than 170 years ago, that there might somehow be consequences, uh, negative consequences, punishments for him and his village in the present. I thought that was a powerful statement about the history of Sierra Leone. My brother, and I history, so I'm here again. So, what do I mean? They said, You didn't go, he said, where well, their great great grandfather went and killed some white man there. So, we are putting information, so we, when you one day we're going to defend. That's a that's fear. So, they don't want to say anything again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You see, they don't, they are fearless and brave in this area because they all know they came from warriors. They don't speak, that's why they are, <laughs> that's why they are brave. They don't speak low. They, when they want to speak in public, they speak, everybody should hear. You want to visit Bobo's grave? Yes, Bobo, you, Bobo, you. Yeah. This one is headstone for Bobo. The, their grandfathers, the grandfathers yes. saw it, but the grandfathers put this stone there. I see. In many cases, uh, it was disappointing that there wasn't much memory of the Amistad case or even of what they called slavery times. Do you think contemporary generations know enough about the slave trade? You they don't. Your own generation. My own generation, will, now they don't. That hasn't no, continued. No, 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 it hasn't continued. There's a saying that if you want to hide something from an African, put it in a book. <laughs> Are there reasons to think that people should be studying the history of the slave trade? This is one of the greatest events in human history. It's great its legacy and ramifications are with us and are going to be around for a very long time to come.
The British fortress on Bunce Island off Sierra Leone is one of many monumental slave trading fortresses that dot the coast of West Africa. It is haunted by the spirits of thousands of people who, in utter terror, passed through. For almost all of them, this was the last place they would ever stand on African soil before they were loaded onto slave ships and carried to South Carolina, Cuba, or Brazil. The fortress on Bunce Island symbolizes the moment when the slave trade was a legal, lucrative business that actually drove the Atlantic economy for a couple of centuries, providing the bodies whose labors on New World plantations would create unimaginable wealth. The basis of the slave trade was violence and terror used to transport people across the Atlantic and literally to dehumanize them, to transform them into property as slaves. The violence in Africa, on the Middle Passage, and in the Americas killed millions. A moral reckoning with the slave trade requires us to think about the mass death that characterized this prolonged and horrific phase of world history. We wanted to find Lomboko, a slave trading factory where all the rebels were incarcerated before they were loaded onto slave ships. Other researchers had been looking for it for nearly half a century. We wanted to experience that place. Okay, let's go. We spent the days in southern Sierra Leone hearing from various elders that our hopes of finding Lomboko were futile. Lomboko is just the name of a river. A transit point. A transit point. So Lomboko means a, a place where you come from and get well soaked. You see, every time I turn to bush, some people have lived there for more than 100 years. They have left there more than 100 years ago. So there's nothing left there. And we were discouraged. We stopped uh, uh, in a small village, and Tazif got out of the car and began to ask people. What did they ever have? Mm -hmm. well, 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 Whether they have now, but they, ever they have, ever their grandfathers have ever, uh, uh, ever had mm -hmm. or told them of a particular area called Lomboko. Mm -hmm. So we went to a village which is very close. You see, to determine. Yeah. Have you ever heard about right. this village, a place called Lomboko? Two uh, fishermen, they are about 18 years old. Mm -hmm. They have been, they get their living in that whole mangrove area. They told us, it's very simple, we know about Lomboko, it's there. They said, take to Mina. So, this is the island. Okay. Lomboko is the island. So there's a river here. So, they are fishermen. They catch fish here. So, when they come with their boat, they stop here and climb the island. Ah, it's abandoned now. So what do they find? 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 They say, well, the place is too old now. But he doesn't have any evidence. They don't go there to look for evidence. They look good there to just tie their boat. Uh -huh. The island, they look around. Look, no, to fishing. Mm. 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 These two boys know the place. And the island itself is called Lomboko? Jomboko. Jomboko. Mm. What are you doing, mother? Jomboko. Jomboko. Uh -huh. So the uh, name is. Poblate, I think you will tell you Boko. Jomboko, but the white man wrote it properly wrongly. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to know more? Well, um, can we go there? Well, we 
yeah, it's safe two at a time or three at a time. But you can always swim. If you want, if you like. Yeah, we can sacrifice one person for crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have crocodiles in the river? Yeah, of course. And you're going to have crocodiles. And the canoe will capsize. No, let's not assume that. <laughs> Well, I don't think it was wise that the three of us climbed in the same canoe, given, <laughs> yeah, the, given, our, given our combined weight. Uh, but we managed. was designed to be hard to find, yes, like Pedro wonderful. Blanco, but That's it was right. this maze of mangrove roots, and right. you turn here and you turn there. It was exciting. We were taking on water at one point. That's right. We didn't almost sink, but we didn't quite yeah. float the whole way. <laughs> It had taken us almost an hour by canoe to get from the riverbank near the village to the actual island. When we arrived on Lomboko, we saw immediately that this island had a sandy beach unlike any other. Pedro Blanco used slave labor to build a landing place for the canoes of African traders when they arrived with slaves to sell. So you can see, the sand here, it's different from the other sand. The, the one very place is mud. A lot of mud, so but what, what, what Pedro and the slavers, when they built the camp here did was, they forced people to bring sand from the sea. Mm -hmm. We have reached a major destination in this trip. We came here hoping to find uh, the elusive and important Lomboko. Lomboko symbolizes the illegal phase of the slave trade. Great Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807 and thereafter turned against it patrolling the West African coast to intercept slave ships and to prevent their delivery of slaves across the Atlantic. Lomboko was therefore not a huge building of brick and stone, a monument, but rather a bunch of hastily constructed slave pens that could be abandoned very quickly if the British should show up. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. This is some kind of elevated ground, probably a hut was built here. Yeah, so let's go. <laughs> this part of the Lomboko complex contained barracoons or slave holding pens. There was no other reason for any other building to be on this island. Mm. So what's he saying? What he, what he did was, was, when Pedro came, he came very late at night, so he used to put a, a canopy. This was the place, he first put, put a lot of sand here. That's why he put the canopy where he lied down under and sat and heard mm. with, with, with Tishaka. Mm. 
That was what his father got for the food. He would meet King Shaka here. Yes. Boboko was the heart of darkness. Tales of its horrors traveled up and down the African coast. Canoes full of slaves being transported to the slave ships, overset in the rough surf, and as the bodies tumbled out into the water, they were ripped apart by sharks. After one such incident, the waters around Lomboko glowed red with blood as far as the eye could see. Uh, foundation right here, another raised up way to see it. Mm -hmm. Basically, seeing it's like rotted wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Andy. No, it's 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Does the chief know anything about sing by PA? Tabe Gugu Hinde, the Gamon, no Waba. So, Boko Yamada, and Mende Yabuku Gani. So, what he did was his grandfather knew how to read and write. The Mende 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 Yabuku Gani. Tell me why he ain't in a saga. So, because he was reading, he used to, I don't know how he was able to read about. Yes, because because the, what the missionaries were producing about. Oh, it. they are producing, that's why. The missionaries came back here and mm -hmm. gave the story of the Amistad so somebody to the wrote it. people. Somebody wrote it. Yeah. Yes. So that, that, that's his grandfather read one of those books. Ah, fascinating. We tell you, Angie. Tell me that They brought him here. So when the time was time to go, they brought him back here. And then shipped him. Shipped him out. Gangel of Force, yeah, Ali. He said he was not going. He said, Pierre Gangero, he He rebelled initially. He said he rebelled initially. I come to watch here. He rebelled here. Yes, initially. Pray before you tear, and I tell you go home. I tell you more, you go. And I tell you, I tell you, I go home. 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 He said he would not go. He said he would like to prefer to die here and die like a warrior than to be taken as a slave. That was what his grandfather said to do. Are you going to film both? You probably shouldn't put film in the same place. Definitely, you can't put it in the same place. So let me go there and let me know where I was. Okay. Okay. One, two. And I'm going to go inside. Go inside. The island was not a place of departure for the ships. The water was too shallow for a ship to come near. It was a holding spot, accessible by canoe only, hard to find, and an even harder place to escape. We're on the Keferi River. Long been known to be a slow, sluggish river, and we've caught it at a very beautiful time in the evening, when the landscape is darker than the sky above. We're in an old dugout canoe, on the kind of canoe that's probably been used on this river for hundreds of years. So we feel like we've tapped into a deep vein of local knowledge as we undertook this part of our search for the roots, the African roots of the Amistad Rebellion. We followed the ghostly spirits of the Amistad rebels to their villages, into the canoes and waterways that carried them from the interior to the Galenus coast, to the dreaded Lomboko where their voyage to the New World began, all of which made their lives, their choices, their determined actions, and ultimately their heroism more real to us. We heard stories about the Amistad Africans that were never before known to historians. For example, that Sengbe and his comrades rose up in rebellion on Lomboko before they ever left their native land. Their history from below, their inspiring tale of resistance to slavery, began in Africa. What we found in Lomboko and Falu and throughout Sierra Leone was living memory of slavery, the slave trade in general and the Amistad case in particular. You know, we're dealing with the Amistad, which, of course, it's, it's been written about for, for decades. And here in a trip that took all of 10 days up line, we've uncovered a number of new and really suggestive ideas. What we've learned has come from knowledge on the ground, uh, whether it's coming from the fishermen uh, near Lomboko or it's coming from the lorry drivers in, in Kenema. It, and it's, you know, consulting these sources that enabled us to do the research that we've done. Our trip allowed us to speak to people, to hear their stories, to access their oral tradition and local memory, and in the end, to deepen, enrich, 
and most of all, humanize the history of the Amistad Rebellion. Then on give we bishops, then give we prime minister, then give we president from Albert Academy. You hear about slavery, you hear about Shakespeare, you hear about Amistad, Amistad, Kata Kata.